Shani Basak joins us now for more. Shani, it could be as transformational as the steam engine for the US economy. Walk us through the logic from Jamie Dimon this morning. Well, there are a few things. We know that JP Morgan has been talking about this in their annual letter for years. We know that he has thousands of people devoted to the cause of AI. They just elevated somebody in their investment bank to play a broader role here to look at data and technology across the whole firm. When they look at artificial intelligence, they do use it in a lot of businesses already. Everything from financial advisors are figuring out how to incorporate it in a more generative way to figure out how to dole out investment advice. Uh, remember, trading desks already use AI at scale. Now, what does generative artificial intelligence mean for the trading desks as well? Data centers, investments in data centers. So you kind of look across the entire spectrum, and certainly AI has a huge role, not to mention anti-money laundering and security concerns within a bank. If you have AI actors out there that can cause harm, as a bank, you also need to have that defense properly in place to ward those actors off. You've been reading Jamie Dimon letters for a very long time and then covering the earnings that come out shortly thereafter. What's the relationship between the two? So there's a few things in this letter in particular that does speak to the business moving forward. You think, for example, what he says about the expectations for First Republic. They had said earlier that $500 million worth of earnings annually would be added, and now they think that's closer to $2 billion, Lisa, if you could believe it. And on top of that, too, he also draws out his concerns. We always look on Friday, this Friday coming up, on what he's going to say about the forward look for the economy, and he gives a little bit of that in the letter today. Uh, a lot of concerns about persistent inflation and the idea that inflation could stay higher for longer. It's interesting he balances that out in a very interesting way. He talks about persistent uh, inflation relative to federal spending and worries about geopolitics, but he also talks about economic growth, and not only in the vein of AI being kind of as productive as a steam engine, but also when you think about how much money economies have to spend for a green economy as well. This idea that, you know, he puts a specific statistic, 70,000 electricians needed uh, to really boost the electronification of the United States, for example. So how much productivity is needed to offset those forces, I think is a big question. We were asking earlier, is this Jamie Dimon as Treasury Secretary or is this Jamie Dimon as CEO of JP Morgan? You know, that's been the perennial question, hasn't it? This letter has always been kind of a swan song to the world. It has been Jamie Dimon's way of really weighing in on a lot of issues that impact JP Morgan and its customers, but also remember they bank clients and uh, governments around the world. There's a whole section in the back of this letter that talks about what it's like to be a good leader. And you have to wonder if that's the handoff story. Is that the note not just to uh, people who are looking at the qualities for the next CEO, but also his own little letter here to whoever his successor may be? He was a little bit kinder, and he said Trump was kind of right in Davos. Then recently he went to the White House and had lunch with Kamala Harris. What is he doing in terms of politics? He's walking a fine line, purposefully. He always has. And there's a part in the letter as well where he says something I think we already know about how he's like a cold-blooded free market capitalist. <laughs> and it's important to remember his economic thinking as we think about how he deals with politicians. He's always straddled the line. It's really interesting to watch him go to Congress. Now they have that annual grilling of the bankers now. They don't ask them the same political questions they used to ask about green energy financing, for example. These things about balance has swayed one year or another, frankly, for these banks. And so he has been able to step up on things like energy financing in a way that has been unpopular at times. But guess what? A few years later, it's less unpopular, isn't it? And so you see that he kind of stands the test of time when he's fighting back on these issues. JP Morgan shares are up 17 percent, more than 17 percent so far this year. I find it fascinating what you pointed out about First Republic and how much they've gained from that. How much are we expecting them to just consolidate their gains as the, as the world's biggest bank? Bank is the U.S.'s biggest bank and really dominating a lot of areas that previously were more open, maybe, to some competitors. Yeah, this whole beginning of the letter starts about the history of bank mergers from J.P. Morgan to Bank of America. And this idea here that J.P. Morgan in and of itself, by 2004, J.P. Morgan represented the consolidation, he says, of four of the ten largest U.S. banks from 1990. If you can believe it, you remember that it had been born off of consolidation, but you forget exactly how much. And now when he's talking about bank rules as well. He's making the case for the whole banking system to keep consolidating, to ward off, uh, this is another favorite one that I had from this, the idea that even Apple effectively acts as a bank. He's talking about all the competition they're facing from the non-bank system, and he calls out one big tech player by name.